All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I hope you all have a great KubeCon so far. Um, today, I will talk about uh, energy and cloud, an emerging field, very new, very exciting. Uh, I hope uh, you all get something out of, out of it. Uh, maybe you can um, move some of the learnings to your companies, to your projects. Um, we will see. But um, you don't need to be like an expert. You don't need to know much about uh, resource consumption and cloud. Um, this talk is very much giving like a proper or a good introduction um, what it is all about. So we will explore all the layers, sort of. I think it makes a lot of sense looking at the layers. And at the end, we will reach like the cloud layer. And then we will kind of figure out what are our requirements in the cloud when it comes to resources and um, energy. So my name is Leo. I'm one of the chairs for the CNCF Technical Advisory Group for Environmental Sustainability. You may have seen, seen us. We have booth. There was also a maintainer talk earlier today. So um, if you like to chat with us, um, tomorrow there's also the booth still open. Come step by. Um, would be great to talk to you. So I think first things first, um, like the obvious question, why should I care about resources? Why should I care uh, about energy? Um, and I think this is like a very common pattern in software that we, we are the software people. We don't really care about the hardware side of things, right? We don't, this is like data centers, resources, all of this. That's like we, are, we choose to build software. We don't want to be uh, involved too much with hardware. So I think it's like also like my mindset when I started building software that um, I, I choose this path. Um, I like software engineering, and I'm not a hardware guy. I'm a software guy. Um, but I think um, so over the time um, that um, this attitude sort of that we are so disconnected from the hardware, from the resources, at some point will, will bite us a little bit. Um, so I think it's going fine uh, right now. But I think we should be a little bit more aware of the resources that we um, consume especially if we build innovative technologies like blockchain stuff, AI stuff, all of this, which is very good in a lot of aspects, but in terms of resource consumption, it's terrible. So it would be great to invent those tools, but a little bit more resource efficient. So um, I think in general, um, to move this space forward, we will not get rid of software. We will build more software. but the software that we build sort of also increases in complexity, but also increases in resource usage. And eventually, that's like it will collide at some point, right? So if you build more and more software and it will consume more resources, um, it would be better to plateau this at some point. So I would say like software engineers in the future should be aware of the resource consumption of the software they develop. So. The only reason why we have hardware is to run software. So there's like a direct dependency between the software that we build and how we utilize um, the hardware. And there are also like more reasons why to care about energy. So for example, if we have more renewable energy, so uh, renewable energy for the most part is based on weather things, right? So the sun is shining, more wind is blowing, and weather is a chaotic system, so we cannot really know like how much energy we have in a month. Maybe we have a lot of excess energy and would be good to make some use out of it, right? So maybe we can, we can stop some processes or um, we, can, we can start, we can stop. Just having knowledge about the resource consumption of our software and utilizing um, our software best when there's like more resources available for us, but stopping when there's not enough resources because some industries they require like a steady power load, but we can just turn off software uh, servers, right? We don't the, the hardware resources do not explode if we just don't set them under juice for a minute. So we have the possibility of being like dynamic in terms of reacting to the energy grid and so on. Right, and um, so I, I found this in the study. Um, the study is a couple of years old, um, so probably like the metrics changed a little bit, but I think this illustrates sort of 
um, very good like that we have like an invisibility factor so we don't really have like a feeling of the resources that we consume so for example um, Google Docs in this case consumes a lot more energy than LibreOffice and there are good reasons for this because there's like some features in Google Docs in terms of syncing with the cloud backups spell checking which are just features that some like gedit just does not have but the point is um, that we as users or also as software engineers in general do not really have like a feeling uh, about the resource consumption so if you use google docs you don't know that you maybe consume double amount of energy than if you would use like a different project right and you can apply this to any other service that you develop um, but i think this is like very illustrative uh, and this is like obviously not not like a new thing right bloated software this is like this is a quote like 30 years ago in a paper and they said like 25 years ago so if you say like over 55 years ago they built text editors with like similar features they were just 8000 bytes and then 30 years ago they already were like 100 times as big uh, and this also like increased in, in years, right? So we use more resources. Obviously, we also solve more complex problems. If we solve more complex problems, there's, you can definitely make the argument that you consume more resources, right? There's a requirement. Um, but um, at the end, we need to look out for the resources. Otherwise, it will get maybe a little bit out of hand. <laughs> um, so the question is like, what is our job? Um, as in the cloud, uh, as cloud native engineers. Um, we are not hardware people, we are cloud engineers. So how does this um, affect us? How can we deal with this emerging field? And I um, like to look at this uh, problem just to reimagine or just to look at, look at is uh, in abstraction layers. So just to recap that we are basically right at the top, right? And we have a lot of dependencies, a lot of abstraction layers, APIs we need to dig through. And one of the challenges that we have um, with energy and resource consumption is that all those information is right at the end, right? We, we do not um, have this already exposed as an API on a node level. We need to dig through a lot of layers um, to get to sort of like the source where the, where the um, metrics is, is collected, right? So um, now we will just move a little bit from level to level and try to understand like what are the obligations and requirements for each level. And then at the end we will reach the cloud, cloud side of things. Uh, and then let's see where we, where we end up. <laughs> right, so at the start we have the hardware level um, nothing too exciting. So we have in the system, we all know CPUs and RAM and all those hardware uh, components. And there are a lot of different like vendors that create those uh, hardware devices. And most of these vendors in the last 10 years or even before then exposed APIs at some point to just move those information about energy consumption up that we have knowledge for the operating system and also for user applications about how much energy do we consume. So there are APIs. They are also quite good, and we can use them. So that's all um, very good news. Um, but there's also like one catch, and I think this is also very interesting to point out, is that all those APIs are based on assumptions. So if you don't have like any hardware device, like a card which you plug in your PC, or if you have like something in the power outlet, and which gives you like the exact numbers, uh, all the software side of things are based on like approximations, which are for the most part pretty good. So we don't need to worry about them too much. But if we look, for example, at one of those um, uh, APIs from NVIDIA in this case, they are also for some um, resources quite a big of an error margin. So sometimes there's like a error of 5%. So if you measure energy with their tool, um, it can happen that you have, that we record 5% more or less energy than it's actually being consumed. So if you um, think this like in the larger scale, if you do like big machine learning models and you don't have one card, but hundreds of cards or thousands of cards, 
5% is, is quite a lot. Um, but those tools are getting better, those APIs are getting better, and the good thing is we are in the cloud, so we don't need to worry about this too much. That's more a job for NVIDIA and for Intel um, at the very low level, which is integrated in their hardware. Um, but we can use those uh, APIs, and they are quite good, so for the most part. And this is one exception, maybe. So at the next level, we have the operating system. And so the hardware, just to recap, was very much about moving information up. It's not about acting on the data, right? The operating system is different, because the operating system consumes this information and actually does something with it. Uh, and we have this pattern also later, um, again, uh, basically on the next level. So the operating system, you have either like static power management or dynamic power man management. If I close my laptop, um, it will go into sleep mode. Some, like the LCD display, will turn off. We will save energy. Um, so there's like um, some things that the operating system does just to facilitate between the um, hardware requirements or capabilities and the application requirements. Um, also like thermal power management. So just to ensure that the hardware is not getting burned <laughs> and so on. So um, trying to the operating system is trying to make the best out of the resources with the requirements that we set on the software side. So if we deploy more applications, the operating system will try to um, give like uh, CPU po um, time to all those processes, right? Um, so on the next section, applications, that's slowly getting in the territory where we are also developing apps, right? So if we have any um, systems also in the cloud, at some point, they, so Kubernetes control plane also is running on some node, right? So uh, now we are getting in the territory where, where it's um, getting more interesting. Um, but you can kind of um, make like a cut between applications um, like Scafandra, which, which I will show in the next slide, which are more about collecting all this information, refining the information, um, maybe also matching it with like um, the power grid to get assumptions about how much CO2 uh, or emissions you produce. So it's about refining um, uh, all this data, integrating with different APIs, depending on which operating system you are. And we have like a bunch of applications that does, does this thing. One of them is, for example, Scafandra, a very nice tool. I like it a lot. There's also the link if you would like to check it out. Um, so basically, what it does is you can deploy Scafandra on Windows. You can de deploy it on Mac OS. And then it will check um, just like which hardware resources do you have. And you don't really need to care about um, like connecting to those low-level APIs, right? All this stuff is being taken care of. You can just run it. You get metrics. Um, that's sort of like the level um, that we have like at the user level. Um, and at the next one, yeah, right. Then on the cloud, there's like the question. So what, what, are, what are now our obligations in the cloud? So if we have taken care of all of this, we surface the information from the hardware level, we have an operating system to kind of do um, like facilitating processes and so on. And we are also transforming all this information. What is the requirement for cloud? Right, and um, I think for the cloud, we have again like the same thing also on the user level. We also want to collect from all the nodes that we have information, right? We also want to refine it. We want to map it maybe for, in terms of how much energy do we consume at each part. But we are also taking action. Um, so we, are, we want to schedule resources maybe if there's um, more energy um, or like in different regions, if there's like a better CO2, CO2 footprint or things like this. We schedule down, we scale up. So we are also taking action at the cloud level. Um, so at the user level, we can also do that. But us usually, this job is being done by the operating system. And uh, as we all know, Kubernetes can be considered the operating system for the cloud. So we, we need to take action for the cloud, because this is just like an abstraction layer where each machine just cannot act, right? Because we need to have like a higher level point of view to actually know the utilization. So what is the state of the art currently in the cloud? 
It's, it's uh, for example, Ke uh, Kepler, which is a very nice tool. Um, it's a CNCF sandbox tool, was donated, I think, last year. And it gives a lot more refined information. So it's uh, native for Kubernetes, so you can deploy it uh, and have information about process level, pod level, and um, also node level. So it's about basically checking off the checkbox that we, like the first checkbox we talked about, about um, just moving up this information, um, refining the information uh, in terms of, okay, I have this pod, I want to know how much energy do we consume. But if we think about, um, right, so basically, exactly, so can we tell how much energy an application we deploy consumes if we deploy something like Kepler? We can, we know, we have a number, we can work with this. Um, but what about like all the other like capabilities of Kubernetes? Um, for example, if you have like scheduling, if we do all those um, like self-healing, rollout, rollback, how does this like affect energy consumption and resource usage? We cannot really tell because we don't have any metrics about this. We know, okay, this part consumes X amount of energy, but how does like all the capabilities, um, load balancing and, and so on, affect like resource consumption? And uh, I would argue this is maybe ne the next iteration or maturity stage when it comes to cloud native sustainability, environmental sustainability and resource consumption that we also take a look at all those metrics which are more familiar to us as platform engineers. And um, so we can actually make like some assumptions or drive action so we know, okay, maybe this pod is breaking a lot, but it's, uh, and because we need to self-heal it all the time, we have X amount of uh, energy wasted. So maybe it's worth it to invest some time to fix it, uh, things like this. So, right, so how does self-healing affect energy consumption? I mean, you need to do like very deep analysis to get this information. It's not very easy to get this information right now. And the same thing also with other metrics. Right. Um, so, right, so currently what we do is we collect metrics from all the pods, all the nodes, um, but those metrics do not tell, I mean, they tell a story, but they don't tell like a story where we can drive a lot of action based on based on those, right? Um, if we want to maybe do like scheduling in different regions, it would be good to know how does like the energy consumption affect like the scheduling, right? So if we want to improve this, we need some sort of different metrics we just talked about. And there's like a lot of capabilities, um, uh, Kubernetes capabilities, capabilities or in, in general like uh, container orchestrator capabilities um, that, we, that we can map to this logic. Um, so for example, some of these, but I was, this is just like spitballing, something that I wrote, I don't know, yesterday or whatever. Basically, we need like some more proper uh, investigation what these met metrics could be like uh, and maybe enhance like a project like Kepler or a different project to get those metrics so we can work with this and have like something natural to us because energy if we just see I, I don't know like kilowatt hours or whatever it's like we don't really know okay is this good is this bad how does this like affect like from release to release maybe also our software um, so we need to tell like a better story and maybe some of those metrics and more metrics uh, can help us uh, sort of achieve this goal. Right, and now we are just coming to the eBPF part, which is but very short. Basically, all of this is not developed. We don't have those metrics right now. If you deploy Kepler or any, or any other tool, we don't get those metrics. Um, but eBPF can be one of the ways to get those metrics. Um, so what we can do with eBPF is not that we collect more energy usage. We don't need that because we have the APIs already. We have quite a good idea of how much energy do we consume. But uh, what we can do with eBPF is that we can map it to those capabilities that we can split up sort of like the total energy and map it to, towards like, like how much traffic do we get from certain services. 
how much, like how far is a certain service? Maybe we can do like DNS dig or something and try to estimate um, how many, like, um, like network-wise, how much um, this service increases the energy consumption, which we need to care about. Um, so, with eBPF, we don't measure the energy, but we unlock it in the way that we have more transparency of the capabilities um, of, of the cloud. So, so, if you would like to learn a little bit more about this, there's like a blog post which I, which I wrote. Uh, it's split in three parts, um, which gives a lot more detail and um, yeah, so if you're interested in this type of thing, all those levels, there's a lot more information, a lot of more sources. Um, I think this is, is a great source to, to go. And if you're interested in exploring this field, maybe even like starting a project or something about exploring those APIs, uh, as I said in the beginning, we have a technical advisory group for envir environmental sustainability. Uh, and I'm always emphasizing the technical part. We are not an activist group. We are a technical advisory group. Um, so if you would like to explore some something like this, uh, step by the booth or join one of the meetings, community meetings, uh, and maybe we can explore this field, maybe drive some standards, something like this. And that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. All right, we have time for questions, I think, if there are any questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pretty nice overview of like, energy consumption here. Uh, so, uh, what I want to know is, like, uh, did you uh, exclude uh, by purpose like the IPMI, DCMI? Sure. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I mentioned this in the blog post. All right. But I um, have not talked about this here, just to get towards cloud and just to not mention too much, to focus it a little bit more. But yeah. like, as you said, our appeal is like a very, it's a model, it's a process-specific model that can, can, it is not real power consumption, but IPMI, DCMI, it does give like a real power consumption because every vendor has to uh, implement that at BMC level. Yeah, and it's and it gives like a real value for the energy consumed by your node at the node level. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. We we know the energy consumption of of nodes and processes. So um, so what Kepler also does is, so the the information that we get from those APIs, Rappel, for example, from Intel and so on, those are um, do not give us information about the process level because they not they cannot give us information about the process level because this is like something which is happening on the operating system level. Um, so what Kepler, for example, does is it uses eBPF to break down those numbers into like smaller numbers, just to map, map it towards like how much uh, energy, uh, CPU utilization do you have. Um, and yeah, so, so this is great. I mean, this is like basically the, the basis that we need to have to drive further action, right? We need to have like some sort of metric but now it's about transforming, I mean, that's like what I'm arguing, um, transforming this information to try to tell a story, try to understand, okay, how can we change the system that we build? Does it make sense to integrate this service? Do we need to re relocate maybe the service to another location? Uh, do we even like utilize all those capabilities that Kubernetes has? Maybe we can also use like a I don't know, cache uh, 3S or something like smaller or something like this. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, what you should also say is that we are at the limits of our data centers at the moment. So, uh, we don't get power lines, we need planning for 600 megawatt data centers in uh, urban regions, this is virtually impossible to get a yeah. power line there. Uh, all the American clouds who start at 600 megawatt per data center 
uh, face heavy, uh, let's say, um, conflicts in the area because of water consumptions and of, of uh, environment conflicts. On the other side, uh, if the developers don't care, this is some personal experience I've seen. We created an application on OpenShift cluster. They came up with 10 H-base systems, so everything distributed, huge databases, and then we tried to measure the uh, load of this thing. And after that, I've told them, yes, H-base is a little bit exaggerated. Uh, you would you could run it on a Raspberry Pi uh, simply. And this is kind of uh, some observation I've made. Uh, there is something like server machism. The guys, and these are normally really the guys who own the most resources in a team, are the alpha members. And this is something which is really driving uh, the entire development into the wrong direction. So you should yeah definitely plan your power consumption before your application scales, then effectively, if you hear on this conference that you have 20% load of your GPUs, you are wasting a factor of five of, uh, of, of, of energy, and this is something uh, which goes into the millions. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, exactly, so if, if we deploy something to the cloud, um, let's we take energy for granted. That's something which the cloud provider needs to deal with. The cloud provider needs to make sure there's enough resources, hardware, servers connected. There's, there's enough uh, power connected to those resources. But exactly, um, so this this mindset will break at some point if, if um, infrastructure-wise. Um, so it is good if you. Uh, to future-proof yourself, sort of, to think about the resource consumption, be more mindful about the resource consumption, and this starts with just bringing up the metrics, understanding the resource patterns, integrating resource, um, like, uh, a sustainability mindset in every single part of the, um, the uh, design of software in the beginning, but also in the maintenance and so on. Um, Hi. Um, is it already possible to relate these um, metrics to tracing, for instance, so you can have insights in specific parts of a, from beginning to end and back, where you lose the most energy, instead of like only a specific microservice? So in, in terms, so there's like some tools I've seen where you can analyze, okay, how much en um, resource consumption um, does this for loop, for example, produce, or things like this, in terms of tracing? I don't think, um, like, most of the observability tools and integrate, like, something like this. So it's, it's something that we need to do at some point, that we further understand um, where's the energy coming from. But, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, so from what I understood also from, from the two of you that asked before me, like we should think of energy consumption like at the time of development already rather than like only analyze it when it runs in the cloud. Do you know of any tools or any, any way of how, how can we shift this left as so many things uh, to like the development life cycle um, where like at the time of testing or in the CI CD pipeline where we could run an analysis on this, like like at least that gives us a plus or a minus. This will increase or decrease your energy consumption. Do you know if there's anything like that out there? Um, so I mean when we start like right at the planning, so depending like how you approach your project, right? So if you start at, in the planning stage, we don't have like any software to test. So I'm not sure if there's like um, things that you can do at this stage. Probably there are. Um, but as soon as you have like something to work with, as soon as you have like features, and if you, um, this depends like how you cut your um, commits, right? But you can measure from commit to commit and see how it 
um, changes. Uh, and those tools, uh, so something like Scaphandra, for example, you can you can just deploy it uh, and expose this energies not just in as a Grafana dashboard, but also as a JSON file. So it's like a format that you can work with. You can um, deploy it. You can run it in in your pipeline, ex um, or have this as a service and expose then uh, those metrics and get feedback um, based on the commits. So that's possible. Yeah. Right. Hi, do you have time for one more question? I think so, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, so uh, previously we were talking about how to um, estimate uh, energy consumption uh, before something is uh, deployed, essentially. And I was wondering how good an approximation uh, is to evaluate energy consumption by uh, resource consumption, such as just CPU memory, something like that. Uh, does it correlate well, or is it just not the same thing? So uh, the further you kind of abstract, the more kind of unsure you are about the real uh, resources, right? So, so on one of the slides, which was ba basically about Okay, software um, measurement um, on for hardware devices. There's already sometimes like an error margin of five percent. So if you move the abstraction layer even further up, you are getting more away basically from those metrics. But um, so, for example, also what Kepler does is in the cloud we we have usually like virtualization layers. So if you don't have access to the bare metal machine, um, you cannot talk to those APIs, right? So you need to have like some sort of um, approximations, um, some best guesses, sort of. And those are um, based on eBPF, as I said before. Um, but they are pretty, pretty good. I don't have, like, I don't know if there's, like, a study about this to under, basically the same study which, which I showed before about error margins of NVIDIA SMI. I don't know if there's, like, one which would be interesting to see, like, what are the error margins um, of Kepler if you don't use um, bare metal, but if you do, like, um, like higher um, approximations. Um, that would be very interesting to see. But I assume it's a little bit worse. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. And I think we can call this a talk. And I hope you all have a great QCon. And see you around. Thank you. Thank you.